a playlist original. Hey everyone, Jeff here from Films at Home. Thanks for coming back to the podcast today. Whether you're watching on YouTube and watching the video version or you're listening along on your favorite audio podcast apps, I appreciate the support. In today's episode, we're talking to Justin Beam. He's a documentary filmmaker and producer who is probably most well known for creating a ton of special features and bonus features for some of your favorite physical media releases. Justin works a lot with Shout Factory. He works a lot with Paramount. Some of his recent releases, he, he's working on the new Dead Silence 4K from Shout Factory that was just announced. He's worked on Red Eye 4K from Paramount Presents that was just announced. He worked on their Halloween set. He worked on some of the Friday the 13th sets. He's worked on numerous different releases for places like Vinegar Syndrome and Arrow Video as well. He really has some interesting insight into the world of physical media, bonus features and commentary specifically. He's worked with some incredible people. And just I think this was one of my favorite conversations that we've had because I learned a bunch. I got a ton of recommendations from him on movies to watch. And it was just really interesting to hear the process of, you know, how these things come together, because we always talk about the the transfer and the audio and the video, but a big part of physical media is those special features, those bonus features, those commentaries, those interviews, behind the scenes stuff that we really, really enjoy. So I think you guys will really get a lot out of this conversation. Justin was awesome to talk to. You guys will really like him too. Now, one thing to note, you can probably hear it right now. I had a little bit of a cold while I was doing this interview. I still have a little bit of a cold while I'm doing this intro and outro here. So bear with me throughout it. But luckily, Justin talks most of the time. So you guys won't have to worry about it. So sit back, relax, enjoy this interview, and I'll talk to you guys at the end. All right, guys. So I'm here for the interview. I've got Justin Beam with me. Justin is a uh, documentary filmmaker who works on probably lots of special features, bonus content, um, commentaries that you have heard and watched on a lot of your physical media. Um, whether you know it or not, I found out a lot of stuff that I've been watching was produced by Justin, um, and I had no idea. He's got quite the catalog, so I really appreciate you coming on today. Um, I think a lot of people know your work, whether, like I said, they know it or not, so I'd love to learn more about you know how how you got into this and your background and sort of some of the really cool projects you've gotten to work on. So if you can just start with like what you're all about um, and, you know, how you sort of developed into this career as, as, you know, a documentary filmmaker who does focus on those, you know, those bonus features and special features, which are so important to physical media. Yeah. Well, thank you again for reaching out and having me on. I really appreciate it. And what I'm all about is exactly what's behind you there. It's you, that's a library. That's an art gallery. That's that's an archaeological preservation room is what's what you're sitting in front of there. And that's really the point of all this is to tell the story, to, to preserve the truth and the history in the creation of these things and to help make sure that these stories aren't lost. Because one of the great things about the special feature is that it's doing what historically prior to the advent of laser discs, for example, really was it, it it wasn't a thing movies were made they came out you had maybe some epk type stuff you had some articles in magazines and newspapers and historically back in the day oftentimes they weren't even real quotes from the people who were involved it was studio machinery cranking out the message on whatever the film was and uh, almost like pro wrestling that's how cinema used to work in a lot of ways where it's kind of there's writers for this stuff but now we have the opportunity to capture the stories of the people involved. And I've just always been so captivated by the mechanics behind the scenes of how these things work and uh, really treasure the opportunity to be doing what I am now, which is making sure to tie those to the titles and hopefully they follow along with it for the, for the rest of time. But so many people, put so much into every film. It's not just actors and directors. It's, it's an army of people who really act in concert as a, as a symphony. 
and they all have stories to tell. And everyone's story is fascinating. I believe that in life, everyone has fascinating stories to tell. And uh, it's just my job to, I guess, set up a stage, put up a microphone, turn on the lights and sit back and capture it, you know? Yeah, no. And you've done a ton of great work, especially in the, uh, I'm a big horror movie guy. So I, I know a lot of your stuff from the the Shout Factory releases, the Arrow video releases. Um, I, I couldn't believe when I was looking at the catalog, I was like, yep, got that one, got that one, got that one. Um, <clears throat> especially, and you're doing a lot on, on um, some of the new 4K releases too, which has been really, really exciting that those, you know, I think, I think there was a worry that it's like, yeah, it's, you know, it's not the biggest format. It's not as big as Blu-ray. Will they continue to treat it? as such will they continue to you know build these great collector's editions and uh i constantly see you post stuff on instagram and, and announce things and i'm like yes good like it's gonna have the behind the scenes it's gonna be treated well um which is super important so you know how how did you how did you get your start did you just sort of start making um behind the scenes stuff or documentaries and then you know people picked up on them and you know started putting them on releases or how does one become the uh the master here of the special feature. <laughs> oh my God. The, the, the masters certainly are outside of me and outside these walls, but thank you. Uh, you're very, in kind. my world, you're, you're, you're up there. I would oh, say for sure. I, your you. stuff is all over my releases. Thank you, man. Thank you. Well, well, to address the 4k thing, first of all, there's been an interesting transition mm. in how things, I, I would recommend anybody who's really interested in getting nerdy, with the whole format side of things with this subscribe to media play news on your social media media play news is it's essentially like a newsletter that's a constant state of the union for physical releases and what the hot formats are so it tells you what percentage this week have been selling in blu-ray to dvd to 4k and and you watch those transitions. You watch as things move. It'll also list what the top titles are all the time. This isn't just meant to be a commercial for them. But Media Play News is really doing a great service to the industry by helping us monitor what's selling and what folks will be surprised to see when they go there and start digging through that data is that DVD is still the, the dominant format. DVD is is far and away the best selling format and blu-ray has been a second place with 4k being a sliver historically but what's interesting now as of the last few months there's a distributor that i'm new to working with that i've been working with and they say they are in some of the biggest physical retail spaces in the u.s and they say that the interest now is kind of leaping over blu-ray so they want dvd and they want 4k so the Blu-ray is kind of now the in-between because every TV on their wall just about is capable of 4K now. And so they're like, who's buying 1080 TVs anymore? Folks really aren't doing a lot of that. So I think as a, if being forward thinking, these retailers are now looking to still hang on to the DVD market while also if we're going to invest in something beyond that, they're making it 4K which has really opened up the market. I'm sure you've seen over the last year for Shout Factory, for example, a, like a real tidal wave of 4K releases of things. And it's not just catalog that's being pulled forward and put onto 4K. It's also new titles. Like I just did um, Ouija, for example, which was announced and that jumped right from DVD to 4K. And 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 then those packages do come with a Blu-ray as well, so they're not just ignoring that format. And it's the same for Paramount. Today we announced today as we're recording here, we announced Wes Craven's Red Eye, which I worked on, and that's a beautiful package that has 4K and the Blu-ray in there. So from the boot, more boutique distributors like Shout through to the big studios like Paramount, they're very much understand people want options with their. But that's a testament to. 4K is, is becoming more dominant now. And where it used to just be a little sliver on that pie chart on media play news, now it's yeah. a bigger, a bigger thing. I, I have I have noticed that because I do follow them as well. Obviously, being in this world, they are the definitive source for all the sales numbers. And I've noticed yeah. and and it's been a trend really like even in just the last six months that mm -hmm. 
DVD has stayed strong in every month. 4K takes a bigger bite of that 1080p Blu-ray yep. liver. And it's yeah. going from 10% of the market to 15% to 20, 25% some months, depending on what comes out. Yeah. And yeah, there's a real possibility going forward that you might see that. I mean, you probably will. It'll probably totally flip and you'll have like your 50, 60% DVD, your 30, 40% 4K and like a five or 10% Blu-ray market because yeah, yeah I mean, nobody's, <laughs> you can't buy a 1080 TV and now yeah. everybody's got, you know, the new Xbox still can play 4K discs. The PlayStation 5, if you buy the right edition, can play 4K discs. So right. that's brought the format. I've heard from many, many people who, just got one of those for christmas for example and they're like i just found your channel what do i buy on 4k what you know oh, do you have recommendations yeah. and i'm like this is great like that's what i was hoping would happen is more people would just discover this by default almost but it's a great format and there's so much great work going on like you mentioned paramount and that i think red eye is going to be is that a paramount presents yeah, it's program. part of the, part of the Paramount Presents series. Yeah, and they've been shifting now to 4K after you know a year of doing Blu-ray. I think they're finally seeing the market shift. So yeah. I love to see that. And and shout! I think they just announced uh, with Dead Silence too. I saw on yeah, on which James I'm doing, Instagram. which I'm on as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know, movies like that that it's like you know those haven't been touched in a very very long time, and now we're getting these great 4K releases. It's definitely definitely starting to come around, which is exciting and must be getting a lot of work for you too, which must be nice, right? Yeah. Well, I don't think that the physical media thing is ever, it, it's not going to go away. The no. The formats will change, but the physical sure. media is, it, people are always going to want to own a book. People are always going to want to own a movie, a, a, an album. Who thought vinyl would be the thing that all the late night hosts are holding up when they have a musical guest on oh, in 2023, but here, right. here we are. So this is going nowhere. All the people who are sort of like, this guy is falling on this. It's just changing. And it's always changed. It's always yep. evolved. And there have always been format wars and on to the next. But the thing right now where we're at, it's kind of this amazing moment. And I'm not trying to dance around the question. You did have a question for me buried That's in right. there. I just stuck on formats. But documentary has never been bigger. If you look at Discovery, if you have the, it's all, all documentary oh, content, yeah. all the networks are feeding into documentary or reality type uh, unscripted is, is still very big, but the documentary, true documentary side of things, I think is a, is the biggest marketplace right now for so much in entertainment. And as such, I think that the streaming services are also starting to pick up on that and including some special features here and there. Mm -hmm. Like I've done a couple titles with Paramount and Blumhouse that were exclusively digital, which is a first for me. I've always been working for the physical format, whatever the medium was going to be. And, but I'm creating special features for them just the same. It's not available everywhere. So I did one that was called Unhuman, which is, um, which just came out earlier this year. I think it maybe landed in summer, I want to say. And that came out on iTunes with the documentary stuff that I created, but I don't think it's available anywhere else except there. So it's kind of an exclusive for them. If, if you get it through iTunes, that stuff still moves with it. And I've seen where HBO and some of these other streaming platforms are also giving you the option for some special features here and there. So I think it's all sticking around and I think it's just going to continue to grow because this is what people are very interested in more than ever. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, no, you're right. It's, I hadn't even thought, but there is that <clears throat> there's been a trend for a while too, of like the, the, the show after the show, like, mm, yeah. like, you know, the HBO shows always have like that. Okay. Well, you know, jump on, jump on HBO max and you can watch the behind the scenes for right. this episode. And, yeah, you know, in, in my head, because it's not physical, I'm not even like connecting those dots, but you're right. I mean, it's totally the, you know, documentary is as big as ever. Everybody wants those behind the scenes. Everybody wants those mm -hmm. interviews with the the actors and cinematographers and I mean, everybody involved. Like you said, not just actors and directors. There are composers and cinematographers who in the cinephile world are as big as directors and actors, yeah. you know, for these people. So it's um, it's definitely a very cool time because... 
I, you know, I, I'm only 30, so I go back to the days of VHS, but there was, I mean, there was nothing that's, that's pre-internet, that's pre-DVD. Um, I never had a laser disc player. That was such a niche format for a lot right. of people. So, you know, who we, was forward thinking though, was Charlie Band. Because on full moon releases, they used to have something at the end of their tapes called Video Zone. So you'd watch mm. the movie, and then at the end of it, they would be like, here's the making of Subspecies 3, or whatever it is. <laughs> he really, un, I mean, I, I'm not sure that he gets proper credit for this, and he may not have been the first. So forgive me if I'm speaking out of turn here, but th- that was incredible for me. And that was my, that was a big part of why I rented full moon tapes was so I could check out that video zone bit at the end, because all I had at the time, I'm a little older than you. And I had the magazines, I had Fango and famous Mm -hmm. monsters. And that was kind of it. There was, there were others, Cine Fantastique and these other magazines that weren't quite as readily available where I grew up in Iowa, but uh, the, the learning about the mechanical aspects of these and the effects artists and everyone else, Charlie Band was way ahead of the curve on that stuff. But, and, and it really was uh, the advent of LaserDisc that brought that to the fore, but so few people had it. Right. And then when DVD came around, it was a little more reasonable price-wise. They just started porting all those LaserDisc extras forward, and people were like, whoa, what is this? I, <laughs> this is incredible. And I'll never forget going over some of those early DVDs and just having my mind blown at the accessibility. It just was the most exciting thing, man. It was so exciting. So is that is that sort of what got you started then? Was it was it that discovery? Back to your question. <laughs> yeah, sorry about the side I'm gonna, road. I'm gonna come all the way back full circle to it. Oh, I gotta that's know. Good. I'm that's curious. Good. Oh yeah, so for me it really began when I was uh little and I've I've always been into this. The books I read are almost exclusively uh nonfiction. I've always been fascinated by people's stories and the I point directly to the Crestwood House monster books when I was really little, getting me into the horror thing. And then on to when I was having buddies sneak me copies of Fangoria in school, like contraband for me to read during recess, like hiding in the corner, the literal movie scene where there's a book in front of me in class and behind it, I have an issue of famous monsters or something. And so the intrigue was always there. I eventually started writing for some newspapers. I was an assistant editor for the Illinois Valley Press Eastern Division and when I lived in Illinois many years ago. And when, while I was there, I fell in love with reporting. And I'd always been writing, but that's really when I started swimming in the opportunity to try to capture people's stories. And that led to writing for some regional music magazines. And then eventually I wrote to the editor of the incoming editor of Fangoria at the time, Chris Alexander, when there was a transition in the editor chair about to happen from Tony Timpone to Chris. And I said, Hey, I've been a fan of the magazine forever. I would love to start writing for you. And I sent him some samples and then we were off and running and to get to the special feature side of things the the articles that I was doing led to me, it actually was a piece on the Halloween four through six arc. So I know you're a Halloween fan. So, you know, for the, there's all these segments within the franchise, even more so now than ever. But at that time, it was the four through six was kind of unexplored. And I was really excited to do this piece. And I interviewed Malik Akkad, who's Mustafa Akkad's son, took over Trankus and Compass and all this stuff. And we just hit it off really well. And Malik and I ended up getting into business together where I became a vice president for Trankus and uh, we co-founded a nonprofit together. And our relationship was amazing. And one of the things that sprouted out of that was uh, the Halloween 4 and 5 Blu-rays because they had not made it beyond DVD at that point. They had had a couple of nice DVD releases, but... Anchor Bay was ready, like, okay, guys, we need to get into the Blu-ray game. And so those are the first two discs that I ever produced. And I did commentary for each of those because we had, like, I remember no budget at all. And I had to push to even do commentaries. But I did, I uh, got Dwight Little, the director of four, with me on that because he hadn't been part of one before. And then on five, Don Shanks, Michael Myers, because there hadn't been a Michael Myers commentary on any of those until that point. and. 
book in the studios, connecting in different cities. I was just, this is exciting. This is so cool. And then uh, as Michael Felsher of Red Shirt Pictures, who I always point to as one of my, I mean, he really opened a huge door for me by asking me to help on a Town That Dreaded Sundown Blu-ray for Shout Factory to produce the commentary on that. And then I, so I got uh, James Presley, who's a case historian in Texarkana. And then on commentary with me where James spoke to the case, I spoke to the film production and it became a really unique commentary. And then I met Cliff McMillan and Jeff Nelson from Shout Factory at a convention. And they're like, oh, hey, we would love to work with you. Do you want to start? Here's our list of stuff. And here's what we have coming up. And they hadn't yet launched Scream Factory. It was about to happen. And from there, it just was like stepping on one of those people movers at an airport. All of a sudden, you're moving three times as fast. And oh yeah, it's, it's been absolute chaos since then. <laughs> so. so this is real. This must be like, so Scream, this is like 2011. 11 i think it was yeah because they launched yeah. in 2012 i think with scream factory right yep and the first one that they actually when they held up their list for me we were standing in the lobby of a hotel and they're like here's here's what we're looking at and i saw on that list taint girl of all films <laughs> if you remember taint girl Lori yep. Petty and rachel and um huge fan and i was actually at that time in the early works with the director rachel on a book about her life and about the production of tank girl i'm like oh this is perfect so i did that was my technically my first in-house gig for shout was tank girl and then i did um, john carpenter and alice cooper for prince of darkness and then on from there on to everything else so yeah i was gonna say i mean they really took off with yeah. that screen fact i think people i don't think people realize that that didn't begin until 2012 it feels like one of those things they had shout factory mm -hmm. but it feels like one of those things that's you know just been around forever because yeah. boy did they just dominate that world i mean i i remember that was roughly around the time that i started collecting physical media um mm -hmm. it was 2000 12 right out right after high school into college i started to explore some more movies and i was like all right let me let me dive in and i remember the some of the first ones i bought not even knowing that like you know screen factory or shell factory was anything like you know was going to be special to me or was a boutique label or anything right. i was just like i want to own halloween so i got halloween and then they had two and three on the, yeah. the collector's editions I believe those were the first two that i ever bought no oh, perfect it's been in a, <laughs> it's been an obsession ever since because then I bought their set. I bought their 4K set, yeah, which I, I believe you worked on as well, right? The yeah, uh, and even the new one with um, H20 and Resurrection. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm all in on that stuff. So they've they've hooked me from the beginning. But it is a they they were on a just a climb from 2012 on. They just took off and owned that horror genre especially those 80s slashers that yeah. a, a lot of ones that had been underappreciated and and didn't get the attention they deserve um like a sleepaway camp like i don't think that has such a following anymore if if shout doesn't do that release yeah that's one that i took to them be, be, and because there there are a few titles it's usually that they call me with the here's the upcoming whatever is we'd like you to have these titles or do you want them uh, Sleepaway was one that, that I was friends with Felissa and it, the box set that had come out through Anchor Bay, which we need to give props to Anchor Bay because they really, in the States, in, in, in the beginning, in the VHS days, I remember when they had special features on VHS tapes, like there was the Halloween and the clamshell that was like the, the, the orange tapes inside, it opens up as a little keychain in the middle. And you would slip the cover out of some of these, like the, Ar the Argento and Fulci and all these things that they really are, they need to be credited for really introducing a larger audience in the States to so much horror. So I, I look at it as kind of the big early two were Shout Factory, uh, but prior to that was Anchor Bay. And there are plenty of other labels that have been doing amazing work for years, like Synapse, Blue Underground. Um, the, uh, now it's 
there's so many it's just incredible and you can get as niche as you want now but back then it was so grateful just to have a widescreen version of something that's in the proper aspect ratio but yeah once shout hit the ground with this scream factory thing it was moving so quickly and i think part of what made it so big is that you could tell that cliff and jeff who are behind this are are absolutely passionate and devoted to the genre and to the fans because they're thinking with their fan hat on as at the same time they're thinking with their business hat on and they were pouring everything into these things bringing in producers from all different walks so we could all pitch in and make them the most that they could be and so all credit really needs to funnel down to cliff and jeff on this and their unyielding dedication to the genre and to these releases because to the i mean there were some early on that we talked about that like alligator for example and by extension alligator too one of the first titles that we talked about back in i think 2011 was alligator it's one of jeff's favorite films jeff i mean mine too it took until last year to get that deal done. That's how long and how dedicated they are and how patient they are to make sure to see these things through and to the Halloween box set that no one thought would ever happen. The Friday the 13th box, impossible. How, in the midst of all these lawsuits and stuff emerges the ultimate package of these things. So it's it's been such a thrill to not only be a part of these, but just as a fan, to watch and to collect. And I'm the same way as you, when these things are announced and they come out, I'm just giddy. It's such a cool time to be a fan. Yeah. And that makes, that makes a lot of sense why they worked so well and why they grew so fast is because they wore both of those hats that I don't think everybody does there. There's obviously it's got to make business sense. We're here. You've got to make money or you don't have a business and Mm -hmm. that's no good for anybody. But you also have to have that that fan hat and that's where they hooked me 10 years ago because it felt like oh somebody's really making releases for like the collector the horror movie lover yeah um they're not just putting stuff out to put stuff out like they are carefully curating this stuff Mm -hmm. they are putting brand new artwork on it brand new features bringing all this stuff to the forefront that now you see you know, in credit to like a Paramount who's, who's now getting there with Paramount presents, but you see everybody else trying to replicate that now. Yeah. Like Lionsgate started to do it with Vestron video and bringing that back. Like they, they were so ahead of the game as to where physical media was heading and how you could be successful in that world. Even as it did begin to contract a little bit, Mm -hmm. I, 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 yeah, I give them huge, huge props because they really, sort of launched a new almost like a new era of physical media that collector's edition that they started to put out in 2012 just yeah they existed before but not in that in that way where it was such like a dedicated line a dedicated series you'd get your anniversary edition or whatever every now and then Mm -hmm. on dvd but nobody was curating a collection like that and now of course everybody you know tries to replicate it so I, i do give them huge props one of the Maybe last things that I worked on when I was at Fangoria, one of the last issues well, close to the end that I was a part of was a Scream Factory issue. It was all mm-hmm. Scream Factory front to back. That was a real testament. Like who gets that? What label merits right. that occurring? And I'll never forget mm-hmm. when Jeff and Cliff had a panel at Comic-Con in San Diego and they were like the Beatles walking in there. I mean, <laughs> a packed room standing room only in the back people to come and they're cheering for the announcements like and the next one you'll never forget your favorite whatever whatever and you start to hear the music and ah people go crazy for it it's unbelievable i wish i could have been in the room for that i've just seen video and photos and of course heard from the guys but what an incredible moment and what an unlikely duo to be heroes at something like comic-con the guys behind a distribution label but what they were doing was so special and what they continue to do is so unique and what they've done for like John Carpenter. Yeah. Single handedly helped resurrect the public prominence and acknowledgement of 
carpenter. And I love that that's happening while John's here to experience it, that he's a part of all of this, that he can participate in these things. Because for a long time, I think John felt he sort of downplays his role in importance of cinema history. He continues to and surely always will. But it's so often that we don't do that until someone's gone. And I'm just so happy that John has been here to see it happen. And Shout is such a huge part and play such a big role in that for him. Oh, yeah. I mean, I he is my he's my favorite horror movie director. Yeah. I'd put him in a top two or three directors, period. Yeah. And that doesn't happen. Like up until I started collecting stuff and I grabbed The Thing and They Live mm -hmm. and Halloween 2. And like I knew John Carpenter from John Carpenter's Halloween. And as far as like 16 year old me was concerned, that was like the only movie he ever made. I was like, this yeah. guy made such a great movie. What else, you know? He, what else did he do? And now, I mean, now I know them all and I've watched them all. I bought them all, but you're right. It is nice that they're giving him the, the, the credit where it's due for, yeah. cause I know he does. I've, I've never talked to him personally, but I, I see interviews and he is very, very humble about how much he's changed. Not just the way movies are made, the music. I mean, everything that he put together there on that and, and even stuff like in the mouth of madness that I personally really enjoy that got a nice release from shout that wouldn't have been probably appreciated at the level it needed to be. I told, I told a guy I interviewed in a podcast a couple of weeks ago. I said, if that movie came out today and like a 24 marketed it and it was like this, you know, this like folk, like that's their thing. If that movie came out in 2022, it would have been like the witch. Like it would have been that level of people would have loved it. And it was just like ahead of its time. So I'm so happy that those things are resurfacing. Um, and that is, it's really due, I know from personal experience, it's due in part to physical media. Without that, you know, you don't find his stuff really. It's not going to be prominently placed on a Netflix or an Amazon. Or I love Shudder, obviously, but and they do a great job curating. But the average person isn't going to be introduced to that stuff. So it is really important, all the work they've done. Yeah, for sure. And I, I like Body Bags is sort of Carpenter's mm -hmm. lost film. And I... John owned that owns that outright, but he didn't trust anyone with it because his experience with Showtime had been so negative and how they released it on this Blu-ray or this DVD, excuse me, and VHS back in the day that had a cover completely unrelated to the movie that he never even saw before it was mm. out on the market. And it was trimmed. The movie was cut. Oh. But one day we were talking, we were working on something else. We've ended up doing a bunch of stuff together over the years. And we were talking and I brought up body bags. And I'm like, you know, this would have such a good home at shout like this. The, it's time for this. And he goes, oh, that, he, the bottom line was he, he entered into discussions with sort of one caveat, just don't put that original artwork in there. And, but me, but having a chance for that movie to be rediscovered mm -hmm. was really exciting. And then on commentary, bringing in Stacy Keach to do that segment of hair with John and the two of them having conversation and then having Robert Carradine come in to do the gas station and those two having a conversation. It was really wonderful. And it's been so cool to see just uh, John participate in the resurrection of his legacy because he's yeah. always ahead of the ball like you're talking about. It's always like down the road when things were discovered or rediscovered. And right. I think it's just wonderful that he's finally getting the love that he deserves. Yeah, no. And I'm, I, I am glad he is here to see it and i just saw him i think yesterday the day before celebrating the uh his birthday with a, a shout factory tv stream i think yeah. they were doing for him so yeah you know i love that I, I mean some people the genius sometimes gets lost until people are gone so that's right. it is really nice to see especially for a guy i really i, I do appreciate and look up to a lot um yeah i did want to ask you mentioned <clears throat> speaking of john carbon you had mentioned you did a commentary with John and Alice Cooper, right? So, interviews with them, yeah. Interviews with them. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm curious, like, what what were some of your favorite interviews that you've done or commentary, like, pairings that, um, you know, people should go look for that maybe they haven't popped in in their collection, but you think are, like, really, really good, interesting tracks that people should, or just, like, 
funny, you know, great interviews, great commentaries. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I, the, one of the first one that comes to mind last year for Paramount, we did breakdown Mm -hmm. and I got, um, I ended up getting Kurt Russell on commentary with the director of that film. And it's amazing because people think that they, that the Russell Carpenter chemistry is what makes those car- those commentaries so fun between the two of them. And in this, I realized that it's, it's Kurt. Kurt brings <laughs> the party to the room. And when he walks in and it's one of the most boisterous, joyful, hilarious tracks as he's cracking up and, Oh my God, do you remember what happened on this day? And he's telling the stories. The whole, so that was a, amazing and definitely a bucket list thing as such a huge Kurt Russell fan. That was a big moment. The body bags commentary was, was really special be, for reasons that may not be so obvious where everyone that I had John paired with made sense. So on his two segments, the third being Toby Hooper's the eye, right? So on John's two, getting him reunited with Stacy was the first time they had seen each other in forever. Same thing with Robert Carradine. So you're getting classic Carpenter in there too, but it's like sharing family stories and yeah, they're talking about the movie, but they're getting into so much more because they have so much history. And then I was supposed to have Toby on there for the third segment. And unfortunately this ended up being not too long before Toby passed, but he backed out of the 11th hour. He was very tired and self-conscious and he was going through a lot of, I think, legal problems with this movie, Jin that he made overseas that became embroiled in a bunch of local mm-hmm. political and religious scandal there. And he was just, it was so heartbreaking that he had to pull out at the last minute. But what happened was I ended up bringing John's wife in, Sandy, Sandy King or Carpenter King, because she was a producer on Body Bags. And she's always been kind of the silent machine working with John on so many projects over the years. And so it was neat to bring her in. And then she and I just had a discussion over the eye and she got to tell about the behind the scenes and the logistical keeping John focused and how we called in our friends for this favor, for this scene and whatever. And it was a happy accident that resulted in a really cool perspective that I wouldn't have otherwise brought into that commentary track. So I was really grateful for that. Another one that is not an obvious favorite is on the movie Willard, the Crispin Glover film Willard. Yep. That movie, in my mind, of course, Arlie Ermey is amazing, but the movie really has kind of, well, two or one in a thousand stars. You have Crispin, of course, and then you have the rats. And of course, we can't have a rat commentary as amusing as that would be. So I ended up calling on the animal trainers to come in, the two guys who had worked with the with the rats, not, neither of which had ever done a commentary before. One didn't even know what it was. And the, and they had hardly ever been interviewed. But if you look at their resumes, these guys have done thousands of movies and TV shows. You name it, and these guys were a part of it in terms of bringing animals onto the sets. So sure, And I'm a huge animal lover, vegetarian, and I wanted to hear the stories behind how they handled this with these animals. And bring them in the room, and they were so nervous coming into it. But it ended up being wall-to-wall discussion. Yes, plenty of information about Willard. But we got into so many other discussions about other productions that they were a part of, insane stories from some movies, really sweet, heartwarming stories from others. And at the end, they were just like, oh, my gosh, this was unexpected, but so wonderful. And I felt the same way. And I'm sure that's a track most people don't hit play on. (laughs) But if I can recommend one, it's really, really cool and infinitely fascinating, those guys. Um, The... Town That Dreaded Sundown that I mentioned was interesting because it's that rare movie that it has a real story, the, the actual murders, and then right. it has the production story. We married those. And then a recent release was on The Company of Wolves. The Company of Wolves was a challenge, a bit of a challenging production because people were spread out all over the place in terms because it was shot in France and Eng- or England, it was shot in England. And, um, but people were French and Australian. And so I was bringing people from all over. And so I had people, and and it's also an anthology ultimately. So it was kind of similar to body bags where I brought people in for their segments 
And I got some really amazing input from various folks, including the writer, the gal who wrote the story that it was the stories that it was based on. Of course, she's not with us anymore. So I got her biographer to come on and he sort of served as her voice. And then uh, I did some a bunch of research on the production designer who's also no longer with us and did a segment reading quotes from his contemporaries and things. So he had a voice in there. So I'm really just trying on that one is, is a good example of one that was so all over the map in terms of where people were coming in from. But I think in the end, it's a very thorough uh, discussion about so many different crucial angles of that film. And people were coming in all the way to the 11th hour. And that's why not everyone's even listed on the packaging. That's a part of that track because, and that's kind of how I do this. I, I'm always working until, until due date to get stuff in. And half the time, like on the Friday box set, I don't think my features are even listed on the packaging. I think it isn't until you get into the menus on there that you see that I did a piece with Alice Cooper on that one. I did. Um, so anyway, it just, and that's only because packaging needs to be done in plenty of time. And I'm always working right up to deadline, trying to trying to like shoehorn more and more into these releases. It's pretty crazy. So there's a few different titles right there that I would love for people to check out. Yeah, I, I, I definitely I have the Willard disc. So now you've got me you've got me curious on that one. That's yeah. like not one I would have thought like, oh, yeah, let me dive into the commentary. But that sounds very interesting. So yeah, I'll have to check that one out. Um, I did. I did want to ask too about like the process because you you just briefly mentioned sort of how it how it works. I mean, how at what point do you get involved and like when when do you know that you know this is the movie I'm working on? Is it you know say for for Friday the Thirteenth, you know shout it must have been one hell of a process to get all the rights and get everything figured out right. Mm -hmm. They knew they were going after it, but is it sort of they acquire it and then they know okay we're going to put out this Blu-ray and then you know they come to you and say hey, we got all the Friday movies, go nuts? Or, you know, is there any sort of like, do you just sort of get full creative? Like, I'm going to go find this person, that person, come up with ideas, or do they sort of sketch things out with you? Mm -hmm. How does that all work? It's a little bit different for different studios and companies. Mm -hmm. So Shout, the Friday was an anomaly. Friday I was brought in at the last minute because they weren't, I don't know what happened. There was, content wasn't coming in or something. And so they were a little bit concerned about having enough extras to really mm -hmm. boost this thing up. And so they came in and said, well, can you just add a few things? Can, what, what can you do? So I instantly, I messaged Alice. I'm like, Hey, we should do this thing on he's back. Cause I'm a huge Friday six fan. I got that rolling pretty quickly. I found Jeffrey Abelson who directed the music video on that, or which is, wasn't Jeffrey was the forefront of the music video revolution. So that all came together pretty quickly, but it was at the very, very end of the, their production on that. Typically, they'll license a title. Like Alligator, we, I knew about in advance just because we've been talking about it forever. So when it finally happened, it was almost like disbelief. Like, So, so you're sure? Yeah. Like, we're, we're good to go on this. Can I start? <laughs> Usually, though, they'll come to me and they'll say, um, we're doing, I don't know, Dead Silence or whatever. And we have the license and we'd like you to do it. Or would you like this title? Or here's a list of six titles. What do you want? And then I do from that point, I, I, my next two questions are what's the budget and what's the due date. And then they let me know. I usually have, I mean, it depends. I usually have a, about a anywhere between a three to six month lead on getting stuff done. And then I, they really leave me to go nuts. I bring people like on, um, Killer Party, which was, do you have that disc? Do you have Killer, Killer Party. Party? Oh man, you got to get it. It came out last year. So this is one that's a good, sure. a good example of uh, a movie that had been on my wish list for a long time. It never, the only DVD was one of those like print on demand things through Amazon, through yeah. whatever. I can't remember what the studio was, but Warner or something. And, but it's a movie that I'd always loved and I've held on to my videotape forever. And, the, and I always said, if I ever get this, it, it, the movie starts off with a music video within the film, but it's a full music video with this great <laughs> synth kind of hairband thing. It's just outrageous when you watch it, you're like, what? And it's like a dual trick opening to it. And then it turns into this great slasher thing. I've always loved the movie, 
And when I got hired on it, I was just giddy. And the first thing I did was go after that band from that opening sequence, because I've always been kind of obsessed with them as a my favorite band within a movie kind of a thing. Well, it turns out they were a real band and they had real career and they had albums and singles and stuff. And I found the two surviving members and did that. So that's something that's another thing that people probably might not watch first when they put killer party in, but that's one that I would add to my list from your previous question is like, these guys are fascinating and they, their story of being taken up to Canada to shoot this little movie in a drive-in convenience or the drive-in uh, concession stand. It's like crazy. These guys are sort of pulled into this world of cinema mm. nuts and their story is really good anyway. But that's a good example of something where Shout didn't say, we need you to cover White Sister. I, I made my wish list and then I just start working on stuff. And then I let them know that I do checking in with them all the time. Hey, what's the latest update? And then I'll send them a list of each title and then who I have shot or recorded, who I'm, who's pending, who I'm still working on. And I just keep on updating that with them over the weeks as I'm doing more and more. And luckily, I haven't had them push back on anything with, with, with what I've turned in. And, over, and I, I took over my own editing on these things, too, probably about a year and a half ago or so, maybe two years ago now. And so I've learned how to edit for the studios, too, because there's a second layer to this when there's like a Sony or mm -hmm. whoever involved where I turn it in, then they have to get approved by that studio. So I've learned what studios want, what they're not so friendly with having included, and I can edit accordingly for as few ripples in the water as possible. But um, so I get the assignment on the disc and then I go nuts. I start shooting and filming stuff all over the place, bring it all together. And then I edit it, assemble it, turn it in. And that's that. It's kind of, uh, I mean, Reverend Entertainment really is me. And yeah. and I have some wonderful DPs that I work with around the world. I'll hire people into different studios for audio commentaries and things, whatever's near them. I've done them. Sometimes I call up, um, someone lives in like Oklahoma, out in sort of the boonies, and I find someone who has a little recording studio in their house. <laughs> and I, hey, would you be interested in doing this commentary thing? Oh my gosh, what is, and then, so trying to make it as easy as possible for anyone who's coming into the chair, quote unquote, and that's part of the adventure, but um, researching outreach to the people to get them involved and the scheduling, editing, delivery. So I don't know if that, does that cover what you were looking for? Or? Yeah, that's actually, that's what I was curious about is, is how much creative control there was i'm always curious and it, it may vary depending on who you work with but i mean is it usually pretty pretty open even if it is say like a paramount that you're working with who's you know the the big billion dollar guys i mean is it still pretty open on creative control because i think that does it it speaks volumes you, you can tell when something's been forced and when something has been yeah. done with you know just pure passion mm -hmm. yeah par it's a little bit different with them just because they are obviously an, an infinitely bigger company than like a shop factory kind of a thing and so things have to be approved on multiple levels yeah and then if it's a catalog release let's say it's a lot easier than a new release so on um i don't know like on breakdown or the golden child or something like that, that I've done. It's really just paramount ultimately who has to review stuff. So, it, but it has mm -hmm. to be okay to clear legal. It has to be okay to clear marketing. And then it's on to market from there. Whereas on a newer movie, like on these Blumhouse and Paramount partnership movies, there's a lot of different aspects to the talent needing to approve things sometimes. So you might have the director or the, or even the actors, sometimes they need to approve the images that are being used, for example. And so they have to check off on that. Yep, this is good, but please let's replace this one. So there's more layers with them than it would be with a shop factory. But creatively, I just, uh, when they hire me in for something, same two questions, what's the budget, what's the due date? And then I create a proposal for what I would like to have happen and what I think is possible. If that's approved by legal and by marketing, 
not legal. If it's approved by marketing and everybody, then they say, all right, go for it, go running. But with there, I would need to check with them to get approval for things I want to add. Mm-hmm. Like on Bad News Bears, for example, uh, I was talking to Jackie Earl Haley, and he um, he mentioned in passing that his dad had been shooting some Super 8 footage on set one day and got in trouble in the studio. I was like, put that away. But I was like, wait, he's recorded something on set? So at the end of the discussion, I asked Jackie, what happened to that footage? And long story short, he found it in his parents' attic, had it transferred digitally, sent it over, and I never thought in a million years that it would get approved. But I send it on to Paramount. They run it by legal. They're like, this is great. It's the only existing footage from the set of Bad News Bears. They understand the historical significance of this. Mm -hmm. All the releases would have been fine to cover this, I guess. And so, bang, it's on the disc. Or on The Last Castle, the Robert Redford movie, we the director had mentioned that they shot a scene for the final sequence in that of this military funeral, but they didn't end up using it or even assembling it because it was right after 9-11 and they thought it was too heavy handed to have this military funeral and this thing. I worked with the archive team and they ended up finding all the dailies from the day. So they, they shot it, but it's just been sitting in pieces in the vaults. Hmm. And then I was just going to use it to cut into the interview with him here and there. But I ended up one day when I was sort of off just uh, messing around and I assembled a cut, finding the best shots, and putting the thing together and I sent it to the, my executive in there. I'm like, Oh, Hey, I put this thing together just so you could kind of see what it might look like. And they're like, Whoa, can we, are you cool with us sending this to legal? I'm like, Whoa, wait a minute. I don't even think I'm legal. <laughs> can I assemble this? I don't know. And, right. and then legal said it was clear and then marketing loved it. So now there's this alternate ending on the disc for the last castle, a James Gandolfini and Robert Redford movie that I cut. <laughs> it's awesome. it's insane it's That's just, awesome. yeah it's like pinch me moments like this but yeah so that is so the reason I, I share those stories with you is just to illustrate yes there are more layers with paramount but the openness to creative input and to thinking outside the norm here hey let's include this footage that jackie's dad shot hey great if we can put this alternate ending together and actually have it seen for the first time and um it's really exciting when that can occur. That's some of my favorite stuff is finding those gems that have just been buried under mountains of dirt for years that no one knows are there. And the archive team excitedly comes back and says, you're not going to believe what we found. Right. And that's happened so many times with Paramount. <clears throat> yeah. They seem to be doing a really, really good job lately. I give them a lot of props. Even the, um, the big one recently was the, all the deleted scenes from planes, trains, and automobiles that they finally (laughs) put out. um, Rumors forever. That had been sort of like a, yeah, like a rumor, like a myth that these existed and and maybe there was an alternate cut or something. And they, you know, they finally put all those out on that new 4k, which was, was really cool. Like, I do love the fact that they're, they're doing that because it is important to people. I mean, there is that history behind all of this that, um, you know, the fans really want to see. So it's nice that I'm glad they're, they're allowing things to pass through legal and, and get through the marketing team. So that's, well, that's Todd, good here. I do have to say Todd who's the head of marketing and really the sort of the creative motor behind a lot of these things. And he came up with the idea for Paramount Presents, for example, he is the, the brain, he's sort of the Cliff and Jeff of all that you've been seeing at Paramount where he, what's his, what's his last name? Uh, is I'm it, not. It's. I'm it's, trying to think of it's the same guy I'm thinking of because there's a there's a Todd from Paramount who has shared some of my videos. Sokolov. Sok. Yes. He yeah. Okay. Shared, I, I did a video about Friday the Thirteenth, a home video history. Yep. And it went from like the earliest release up to the new the new box set and covered all the different releases and features and things that were included. And that was like one of my super cool pinch me moments was he shared it to his LinkedIn page and was like this is like amazing. This is the future of yeah. like these, these content creators are keeping physical media alive. And I was like, Oh wow. Look, look at that. That was cool. So I was wondering if it was the same guy. Cause he seemed to really appreciate that sort of thing. So that makes sense. And that's why this is all happening because yeah. historically Paramount wasn't famous for giving a lot of love, especially to genre stuff, mm-hmm. cranking out the Friday, the 13th, 
with their covers that were irrelevant. Remember the DVDs with the irrelevant, the weirdo covers? I, I talked about it in that video. I was like, these Dude. covers don't. There were some VHS releases too that just yeah. had artwork that, I mean, it's not even in the movie. It's like, what, yeah. where where did this stuff come from? It was very much a different situation before Todd came in. And he has done so much for fans. And yes, yeah, so not, I mean, not everything can be re-released. Not everything can be can qualify for the investment that they need to mm-hmm. make in these things. But he is finding a way to make so much happen with titles that have kind of been neglected in the past, especially beyond maybe early v- DVD or something that just keeps getting reissued. And so he's behind, like on the Adams family, the Babushka scene, the dance scene. Hey, we, <laughs> yep. the archive team finds an extra a whole bunch of footage of this thing. Well, let's release the Mamushka version and let's cut this in. So if people want to see it with a little more joy in the dancing, it's there. He yep. is invested in the same way that, that Jeff and Cliff are. And that's why I think I love it. Just I feel such a kinship with these guys. And it's so easy to work with them because it's we are speaking the same language. When I when I throw a title at them and oh you know maybe we could make that happen maybe we could do that or th- it's it's just such a harmonious thing on both of those fronts because we really are all thinking on the same page. Yeah no and you can th- that makes so much sense and and where Paramount has shifted recently where they've become what quickly become one of my one of my favorites for physical releases mm-hmm. because of all the catalog work they're doing, all the features they're putting on these things, the Paramount Presents line, right. just, you know, that is, that makes a lot of sense. You have to have that that fan hat on. If you're yeah. purely business, I've always thought, like, this just won't, it won't work. It won't work if you're in it, if you're purely, because you have to think who's buying, these, especially in 2023. Yeah. Who's buying these? It's not your average consumer who goes to you know you don't just walk into walmart anymore and walk out with five movies you know it's not 1999 that doesn't happen anymore so you have to think about that person and he's he's clearly got that in him that you know same as the the shout factory guys do and i'm sure people at you know arrow and all these other boutique labels too that have really started to get it lately like oh yeah think about vinegar i mean i yeah. I love working with Vinegar Syndrome on things. I've primarily served in the role as editor for them on some stuff, although I've shot a few interviews for them. But mostly I just edit the edit the features for them on the pieces that I'm involved with. Talk about a label that has not only... I mean, they are revolutionaries too. Yeah. They are doing something genuinely different and introducing a subscriber service and the limited edition slips that are so quality. Like they're not going to fall apart from being watched time and again. They're really nice, oftentimes embossed covers, and the they they really are they are the epitome of it's almost like the like a next level something weird. Like what Mike was doing yeah. with something weird was finding stuff that everyone else was just throwing in dust you know, trash bins. He's pulling that stuff out, scanning it, putting it on disc, and putting it out in collections and you know remastering takes a back seat to just i'm just glad this is here and right. i'm just glad that this hasn't been lost to the sands of time and vinegar is releasing the least obvious stuff across the board <laughs> and i've worked on things like video violence one and two and blades and all these other movies that i that i like that I, but i thought there's no way on earth that i would ever have a chance to be a part of this and then uh terror vision by extension which Began, it's a record label that's been around for quite some time. They tried the video thing as a sub label under the Vinegar banner, which Vinegar, Vinegar has all these sub labels. Now, yep. Terror Vision is off on their own and being wildly inventive with what they're doing and international licensing of movies like Norway that I worked on for them. It's this beautiful, bizarre a vampire film that has to be seen to be believed, just a truly gorgeous movie. That didn't even get released in its own country, really. It's <laughs> it, This is the first time anyone anywhere has put their money where their mouth is to say, I believe in this. This is beautiful. Let's get this out to the world. And uh, so a huge, I can't applaud the guys at Vinegar and Terror Vision and these other, th- these labels that are pulling the true 
the 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 stuff that's that no one thought would ever see the light of day again and giving yeah. them the time to do a new transfer and to throw features on there and the deluxe packaging and everything so oh and they so they awesome. constantly i am a sucker i'm a huge sucker for vinegar syndrome they have me buying stuff <laughs> all the time i mean it, it's like going back to the video store when you would rent something just based off the cover art yes. of the title yeah and that's I, I just did it the other day they had like a the 10 I for buy 10 thing. all the time there the texas chainsaw massacre 2 set yep I bought it and mistakenly bought it without the slip cover. Mm -hmm. I literally emailed them and I said, I screwed up. I, I need that. Like how much can I pay you to just get the slip cover and ship yeah. it? And they were super cool. They, they actually just, I said, I'm going to place another order. They threw it in there with it. Oh. Um, I paid them like four or five bucks for it. Yeah. Awesome company to work with. And they had me buying now. Now I'm going to pull it up because it was two movies I'd never heard of, but they did like a ten dollar sale the other yeah, day. Yeah, the ten for ten last week. Yeah. Oh, and I was like, I'm going through the list, and I was like, all right, I gotta grab some. So I got, <laughs> I got Shallow Grave nice. and the Scary of Sixty First, which okay. purely both of those just based on I looked at the cover, I read the quick synopsis, and I was like, all right, I'm in on those two. Yeah. Like, who would have ever? Yeah. Did I mean, you get blades? Did you buy blades? <clears throat> I don't know if I have blades oh. yet. I have you got it. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not also sure going to go broke if I buy it all. So I have to, be <laughs> I ready. know that's the challenge, right? The yeah. blades is the most sincere tribute to jaws ever, but it's about a lawnmower on a golf course. Oh no shit. I jaws is my favorite movie of all time. Same so. for me. It's my favorite movie of all time as well. And I can I tell you that, when you watch this, <laughs> There's so much that you're going to be smiling. Your face is going to hurt by the time the thing is. <laughs> okay. It's the most ridiculous fucking concept of a lawnmower a, a stalking people on a golf course. But it's it. handled like Jaws and there's a quint. And there's the scene where they open it up. And there's all this stuff. You are going to have a blast. And I cut the, the features on that one. And I rediscovered it because I used to have it on a double disc with um, another movie that I really love called Bloodhook, which is actually what initially sold me on Vinegar was that they put out Bloodhook, which mm -hmm. is one of my absolute all-time unquestionable top-of-the-heap favorite movies shot in Wisconsin. And Anyway, um, Blades is something that Troma had vomited out on these terrible discs that they've been doing forever that are like, you know, 420 DP and whatever. And um, just sort of been relegated to that but it there's such a brilliant play on jaws and that thing i can't recommend it highly enough oh um, man that's i just wrote it down that's at the top of my list you now for the next time out. i go in and do a, a vinegar syndrome haul because oh my gosh yeah that i just and that's the they have so much every time i go in there i find something new that i missed before i just and like who would have ever thought some of the stuff that they're getting to 4k like i bought madman on 4k and i'm like <laughs> Who would have, no, nobody would have ever guessed right. that you didn't have the chance to own that before. And it's such a beautiful set. But then they'll put Roadhouse. Then they'll have Roadhouse right. available right. on 4K. You know, yeah. it, it's so wild. And you know, you, you brought up something a minute ago that I think is very vital. And what is exciting for me about like an, uh, Mill Creek, for example, Mill mm -hmm. Creek, remember those, those sets that they would put out with like 50 driving classics, 50, oh, yeah. whatever. Those were kind of for the age, the sort of post video store age, that was the equivalent of blind renting, which blind renting, I can speak for myself when I was a kid, I went, I frequented every video store in town. And when my library started doing tapes, I was renting everything there. And it was, it's like an art gallery you're walking through. As you yeah. said, you're just choosing it off of a cover. Heck yeah, I'll take this home. This looks so weird. Dead pit, push the button, the eyes light up. You're coming home with me. And that was everywhere. And it wasn't until like as the video stores were kind of waning and we didn't have a place to go to blind do that, these inexpensive sets that would be 10 or 20 bucks for like 50 movies, you go yeah. home and you just watch through them, stuff that you never would have thought to rent on its own. And I think that, that Mill Creek has a place of importance that isn't really acknowledged because those bargain bin sets were instrumental in a lot of pe people discovering a lot of fringe cinema, I think, over time and really oh, yeah. helping us expand our horizons for what we're interested in. Do you feel the same way? Were you picking those those up as well and discovering I, things? I, yeah, I've got one. I've got a few still in the collection. Um, I, I remember they did 
it might have been maybe it was milk they did one that was like 20 tv it was like tv movies and other stuff based on stephen king oh. books that was you know just stuff that you wouldn't have been able to get anywhere they were <clears throat> shot for tv movies or yeah. um you know shorts things like that um i know i have that one because i love stephen king i had a lot of the big horror box sets yeah just like you know just horror, horror movie vomit into like you know 50 movies on like four dvds yeah <laughs> yeah they were all like compressed down to nothing oh but yeah you, you got to watch, yeah. You get to experience so much, and I, I do love those. And the whole, you're right, the blind renting thing, which you know, the one that always stuck out to me was uh, Evil Dead Two. The mm. artwork for that, as yeah. a kid, yeah. scared me. And then when you actually watch the movie, you're like, wait, that artwork, yeah. it's it's not even in the movie. The movie. <laughs> that guy, that guy's not even in the movie. Yeah. So like, wait. but yeah, that was the sort of I I distinctly remember walking in, and I'm. You know, I'm I'm coming up in the '90s, so I'm growing up as these stores are going away. Yeah. So I'm like, and I remember being like, "That looks really creepy." And then one, when I'm older, I finally watch it. And I was like, "Oh, what the hell? Yeah, where's the where's the skeleton guy?" <laughs> what, and and don't you think that there's an aspect of that in what Vinegar does? And I know that they catch some oh, yeah. flack for this too. The most beautiful covers, incredible yeah. artwork on these slips, and it's all so serious, and it's all it's as though they've put years of love into the design and careful consideration of these covers and then some of the times you put the movie in and you're like <laughs> yeah whoa what right. <laughs> what is this this is I, I love that sort of bait and switch even though it's not yeah. really i mean we can research however we want online now we don't it's it's hard to be hoodwinked unless you want to be but i treasure the fact that they're putting these things out with these grand designs and limited yeah. edition things for a movie that is just not uh, sometimes really not that great for me for my standards someone else yeah, more that, power you're but... right though that's the coolest part about yeah. it is just like the care they put into this movie that was like shot on some guy's camcorder in the set in the 80s and for five you know 50 bucks yeah and you know his friends and family yeah and that you mentioned i think the the agfa that does some really yeah. cool stuff too i love i love that stuff mm -hmm. so i'm a real my dad will always give me a hard time because he'll be like, hey, have you seen, uh, you know, this movie, this very popular, like, 70s movie he grew up on? And I'll be like, no, but I have seen, like, you know, super obscure movie that you've, he'll, he'll be like, you've seen, like, killer clowns from outer space, but you've never seen, you know, this or, <laughs> and that's a pretty tame example. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, he always makes fun of me because I dive into this weird, weird stuff, but I love it. That's all these shelves behind me on the back wall. That's just the wall of weird. Even the Criterion stuff that I buy, yeah. I lean towards their weird horror movies. Me the too. stuff that's, you know, Japanese stuff or whatever. Arrow's mm -hmm. the same way. I love that. I mean, it's such a cool it's such a cool thing that we get to experience that like even 15, 20 years ago was like really, really hard to come across. And yeah. these new labels are doing such a good job. Yeah. And I and it, it can be cost prohibitive for a lot of people and that's why i sure. like when vinegar does something like mm -hmm. a 10 for 10 yeah or when criterion does their barnes and noble sale for 50 percent off it's a way to make it more accessible for more people and i think that that's a really wonderful thing that i always try to promote hey guys the barnes and noble sale is on now if you yeah. want to go out there here's a few ideas for some killer titles that you can pick up for a really good price so it's it's great that they're continuing to do that and walmart stocking continuing to stock first run dvds and a lot of uh, especially indie horror dvds stuff that yeah a lot of stores wouldn't even touch like no, best really buy wouldn't want think. To do it yeah yeah and i think that's incredible because i know a lot of filmmakers who have their titles in there and how much it means mm. to them to have a, to have space to have some real estate in a right. store right next to whatever the hot new release is and i think yeah. that's a, it, it's in a way to level the playing field to some extent and i think that's a real tribute to the buyer at walmart who changed a few years ago and since they came in they've been so much more open to not only genre stuff but also to 4k which was just invisible in walmart historically mm -hmm. but now you're going to walk in there and find a wall of 4k because he believes in it he really does the people who are in charge of this stuff now are the fans and i think it's right. an important moment for for us to be able to take this it stuff is. in, let alone create it, you know? Yeah, no, it is. And that's, I, 
and that's why I'm hoping, you know, the, <clears throat> the few that might be lagging behind or not embracing this as much, I, I've, I've offered myself up. I've been, I've said, Hey, do you want to talk to a fan? I, I can tell you what I think you're doing wrong and what I think people mm. <laughs> think you're doing wrong. And yeah. We can, we can fix this. And, you know, some of, some embrace that some, some don't, it's, you know, some of them are business, you know, purely business and I get it, but the ones that embrace it, there's definitely still a place for this and you can definitely do well. You just have to be, you have to be creative, right? you know, like, like shout, like vinegar, like paramount has gotten, um, even, even Sony with some of their, the Columbia classics box sets yeah. and things that they're doing. I mean, you just have to get creative and if you get creative, people will scoop that stuff up. And yeah. I, I think that's what some people forget sometimes is it doesn't have to be the brand new shiny release. Like if you package it well and you put enough into it that I'm good spending 25, 30 bucks on this thing, right. people, people will do it. Yeah. And you can tell the difference from company to company because yeah. what you're seeing on that shelf is heart. Right. You're seeing the hearts of the people who are behind making sure that alligator made it to 4k. That alligator two made it, whatever it is, because it doesn't have to exist in any state in this day. But a lot of people invested time and energy to bring these things across the finish line. And it's the same thing on the special features. Do I always get everybody? Of course not, who are involved with these. There's a lot of reasons why I might not have gotten. And I know people are going to ask when something comes out, there's the inevitable, but hey, where's blank? How did you sure. not? And I'm just trust me, I tried. <laughs> and I, and I, as I said earlier, I'm going, I'm trying up until deadline, like, oh, wait, I got this last minute thing. Do we have time? Yeah. Just get it in here tomorrow. Okay. Then I'll be up all night cutting this thing and getting it turned in because I just want that last piece on red eye. We, uh, discuss while, while we were midway through production on that, we discovered this interview with Wes Craven in the, in the archives, in the vault that no one had ever seen or done anything with before from during the production of red eye and i'm like can you can we pull that scan it and send it to me i would love to do something with this and so i got to assemble this thing into a nice piece wes in his own words talking about the film in, in an interview that's never been seen before stuff like that that uh, you know it, and it was a last minute almost last minute kind of thing that they that paramount was cool with putting on there of course but for me once i knew that existed i was I was going to push as hard as I could to find an avenue to get that thing on that disc because it matters that much to have as much as we can on these things, you know. All right, and especially for somebody who has, you know, Wes unfortunately passed, and so yeah. you're not getting anything new. Yep. So to find something brand new is super special. I'm very excited for that one because I think that movie is um, severely underrated. Yeah. And I, I remember watching it when it, when it came out, I was somewhere in my teenage years. It was the perfect movie. And, I, you know, I think we got it from Netflix, DVD mm -hmm. through the mail, Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact. Sure. I was I was an early subscriber to Netflix through the mail. Um, yeah, that movie's great. And yep. so when I saw it, I hadn't thought about it in a while. And I saw the announcement literally today, right before we recorded this. And I was like, oh, that's so exciting that that is not only coming out, it's getting a 4K. It's getting this great release with features, this new packaging. It incredible yeah. so you know i really every it feels like every day now there's a new announcement and it's like what a time to be alive if yeah. you're into into movies and in physical media it's just an incredible time so, and for wes i mean for me and that one yeah like this is for wes we need yeah. to help help give as much of him as we can to the fans if anybody has their hands on anything a photo to an interview or something like we this is legacy this yeah. is history and uh, I, I wouldn't, I was so thrilled to find that thing and, and be able to assemble. It's a tremendous honor to see that, to be seeing it. Like on Blue Hawaii, they found all these archival photos from the production, from set of, of behind the scenes and things. And there's nothing unseen in the world of Elvis. I'm a huge Elvis fan. So it was a dream to work on. But that was another thing where we already had this other stuff for the disc all set. But then they found these photos and I'm like, oh, we have to do like a montage of these things because no one's ever mm. seen this stuff before. And to yeah. be the person who, where archive is uploading them to me and I'm looking at these for the very first time, like there's nothing in the world that hasn't been seen for Elvis, it <laughs> seems. And right. to have first eyes on this was 
oh man, that's the stuff that really gets me just pumped up. So exciting. Yeah, no, that's, oh, there's so much of that, like lost media that it's, it, it's exciting because these new releases and these remasters that they're doing are sort of surfacing a lot of things that I think had, had been lost or forgotten. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, yeah, there's so much great history out there. So yeah. it is a, a very exciting time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I did, uh, we've been, we've been going, I kept, I kept you longer than I said I keep you, but this has been a really oh, cool it's conversation. Fun. So I really appreciate it. I did want to ask before we go, mm-hmm. do you, do you have plans for, uh, you know, you've done a lot of documentary work. Do you have plans for any, are you going to do any feature length longer stuff? Cause I, you know, I look at like these in search of darkness or in search of tomorrow and those did so well. And there's all these documentaries coming out about like specific movies. I saw one today that was being released about people who kids who grew up with people who worked on the child's play series and how that affected them as kids. Like just really interesting. And you have so much interesting stuff that you've worked on. I mean, is that a, is that ambition at all? Or you sort of, you like what you're doing? Um, I'm I'm curious. I'd love to see something, you know. Oh man, I, the Halloween one. The it's a short, but I love you. Can't kill the boogeyman. That's a great piece. Oh, thank you. That was that was a thrill. I mean, that was yeah, a wild experience back when that occurred. That was <laughs> unreal. Uh, all this is unreal, frankly. <laughs> uh, but I, I do. I I have. There's a lot of things that I'm working on right now because right now, you know, I've been doing this for quite a while, quite a few years. And even dating back into the magazine article days when I had just thousands of interviews over time with so many people between the magazines and the discs and everything, there's a lot there. There's a lot that I can do something with, with the interviews as in uncut because of course only a certain portion of the discussion ends up in these things. Mm-hmm. And so there's that, but then beyond that, yeah, there's definitely in both documentary and also fe- like narrative feature there's there's a number of things like irons that i have in the fire right now that i'm nurturing and hoping to bring across uh in because i feel like it's time to grow i think it's i I love doing this as i've said a million times i'm so honored to be a part of all these stories and everything but i do feel like it's time for me to expand into new arenas and that's definitely a huge focus for this year and beyond yeah very cool no i it to a to a lesser degree because those are a lot bigger than what I'm looking at. But I feel the same way when I hit a hundred I hit the hundred K mark on YouTube and I said, How can I how can I do more? How can I expand? Yeah. You know, you do everyone has that itch, I think, if you're a creative person to expand. So that's I, I figured that might be your answer and I'm excited <laughs> that it is because Thank you. I'm really I'm I'm looking forward to that. So definitely keep me posted. And uh if anybody listening, watching, if they want to stay up to date with with everything you have going on, where can they find you? My website is justinbeam.com. That's B-E-A-H-M, my last name. Uh, there's a also a subscription thing on there where you can sign up w- with your email and it'll send you a little note once, whenever I put a new post up, which what I put on there is news about mm-hmm. upcoming releases and when features are announced, sometimes some extra behind the scenes stuff. So that's a good way on all social media, just my name, Justin Beam. Uh, I'm really bad at taking care of social media. And so there are reverend entertainment pages too, but they basically just say, Hey, follow Justin. Cause I can't keep up with all of it. Yeah. It, you know, keeping entertaining content on there. So but yeah, just look for my name anywhere. And you can also email me through the website. You can reach out through social media. My messaging is all wide open and I love to connect with people and, Always happy to answer questions uh, if you have suggestions for things or titles or whatever else. I mean, this is the heart of the whole thing, and I would love to hear from people 100%. Well, that's good to know. I will definitely be uh, <laughs> I'll be in touch because I constantly have suggestions and yeah. <laughs> things I'd love to see happen. So yeah. if you're open to it, uh, I'll send them over. I'm here. Um, the door's awesome. open. Well, I really appreciate the time. This has been awesome. I haven't every time i do one of these conversations i leave with like another list of five to ten movies i gotta buy and i've got them (laughs) again so i love this this is how i'm learning so much too and expanding my my film knowledge so blades is at the top of my list if there's a if there's a jaws knockoff i thought i had most of them so funny i must have missed that one so funny so i'll be grabbing that but yeah i appreciate the time thank you so much for for coming on here and 
Um, any uh, anybody wants to find you, Justin Beam, B E A H M, JustinBeam.com, and on social media as well. So, Justin, thanks for your time, and uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. All right, guys. So that was our interview with Justin Beam. If you want to find his work, you go to JustinBeam.com. You can find him online. All of his social media profiles are Justin Beam, B E A H M. I've been following him for a long time. He always announces what he's working on and has some really cool insights into, uh, you know, certain things in the physical media world. And it sounds like he's got some very exciting projects planned for the next year, two years, three years. We'll see. But I can see him definitely doing some awesome documentary work, some feature work. I'm very excited to see uh, where, where this takes him because he's a super talented guy. And of course, you probably have lots of uh, new movies to go out and buy now after listening to this conversation. I know I do. Um, and some of those commentary tracks that he mentioned that I would have never thought to listen to. Very, very interesting stuff. So I thought this was a great conversation. And if you guys enjoyed it, please let me know. Let me know in the comments on YouTube. Like the video. And if you're on Spotify or Apple, make sure you leave us a five-star review if you enjoyed this. And follow along the podcast on your favorite podcast apps. That helps us get up on the charts and raise our podcast to the next level. So I appreciate that. As always, make sure you check out links down in the podcast description or video description. You'll find my social media links and other ways you can support the channel. But the best way to support is listening and watching. So thank you for doing that and making it to the end here. So have a great rest of your day. Stay safe and stay healthy out there. And I will talk to you all soon. Coming soon. Be sure to subscribe to the Films at Home podcast using your favorite app so you don't miss another episode. And while you're there, don't forget to rate and review this podcast, which helps us out tremendously. You can also help support us by watching our short form content over on YouTube and TikTok by searching Films at Home. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at films underscore at underscore home. The intro and outro were created by Elon Osborne. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.